is the reduction in the stock's price. The proper trading terminology for the reduction of a stock's price in the market is in the market for the stock. Why? Because if I asked you where Qualcomm is trading at, I would ask you professionally, what's the market for Qualcomm? Where's the market for Cisco? You would respond to me with its firm, uh, two-sided bid offer price and its trading volume. Are you with me so far? Yes. You might say 50 by 50 and a quarter, 8 by 10 in size. Are you with me so far? So in the market for the stock, is referring to its price. Dilution is the reduction in the market for the stock. The reduction, stock price goes down because the board of directors of the company implemented a strategy that once that strategy was executed to the open market, as you're about to see, caused more shares of common to be outstanding than were prior to that strategy that diluted or reduced the stock's price. The stock price going down in the market as a result of dilution has nothing to do with the sell-off in the market that usually drives stock prices down. But rather, because the board of directors implemented a strategy, and when that strategy was implemented, it issued an increase of the number of shares of common outstanding that diluted or reduced the stock's price per share. Let me give you an example of what I mean by dilution. Usually we've said now, stock prices go down on selling. I'm telling you that there was buying coming into the market into this stock. Are you with me so far? Yes. That buying should have driven up the stock's price. Did I ask you where that stock price closed in the marketplace today? You said it closed down 5 eighths. I said, well, why would the stock price close down on buying in the market? You would think it would close up. Well, I would say that stock price went down 5 eighths per share because the stock got diluted in price. Completely different in the reduction of the stock's price. It's completely independent dilution of the stock price going down of selling pressure. Let me give you an example of what I mean. Uh, a while back, American Express, listed on the New York Stock Exchange, IDS Amex, common stock, was trading at 150 a share. Are you with me so far? Yes. Pretty expensive. The company, board of directors of American Express, wanted to intentionally take down the stock's price, reduce it down to make it more affordable for people. Are you with me so far? Yes. They felt that 150 a share was approaching an overvaluation. Are you with me so far? Yes. Uh, and um, what Amex did was three for one forward split the stock. Now, once the board of directors splits the stock, and only the board of directors can split a stock, and if the first number is larger than the second, it's called a forward split. In other words, if I said they won for three uh, split the stock, that would be a reverse split. So they forward split the stock three for one. After that three for one forward split hit of a stock that was trading at 150 a share, the stock then was trading at 50 a share. Now, you don't really believe that this stock lost 100 points in value in the market on a massive bloodbath and a sell-off. That stock didn't lose 100 points from 150 to 50 because it was sold off in the market and crushed and pummeled. Are you with me so far? Yes. It was intentionally diluted. <laughs> excuse me. Excuse me. <coughs> Jesus. It was intentionally diluted and reduced down in price by the board of directors of the company uh, to dilute its price as a result of the forward split so that now at 50 a share it would become more affordable to people to stimulate buying. So why does a company dilute the stock's price? which is completely independent now of selling pressure to make it more marketable and affordable and stimulate buying because we can afford that stock at a greater value at 50 a share than 150 a share. So all of these strategies that you're about to see intentionally dilute or reduce down the stock's price as a result of the implementation of the strategy which is causing an increase of the number of shares of common outstanding that will ultimately dilute and reduce down the stock's price per share. Let me show you what I mean. Here's your client. Your client owns 1,000 shares of GHII stock at $10 per share. His cost basis of the stock per share is $10. His dollar valuation of his common stock portfolio is $10,000. The board of directors decide to forward split the stock two for one. After they split this stock two for one, this is what your client's portfolio looks like now. He now owns 2,000 shares of stock, double the amount of shares than he had before. Remember, he didn't have to pay for the additional 1,000 shares. It was given to him as a result of the forward split of the stock. And now he owns the stock at $5 per share. Stock price diluted in price. Are you with me so far? Not only in the price that he owns the stock per share in, the, uh, in his portfolio, but in the market as well. But take a look at his value. He's still worth $10,000. He shouldn't be worth more than 10. He didn't send any more new capital. He's not worth less than 10, but he has double the amount of shares, increasing the number of shares, reducing and diluting down the stock's price per share, and his cost basis of ownership per share without changing valuation is dilution. Are you with me so far? Here's how you work it. 
You take the first number of the forward split and you multiply it times the original number of shares that he originally owned in the position. So 1,000 shares times 2, two is meaning 2,000 shares after the split hits. Take the original cost that he paid for the stock, which was 10, divided by the first number of the forward split, which is 2. He's now going to own the shares at a lower cost, diluted cost, of $5 per share without changing valuation. More shares? reducing the cost of ownership per share or the market price of the stock, diluting it downward uh, as a result of the forward split without changing valuation is dilution. Let's take a look at the stock dividend. Your client owns a round lot at 11 per share. Are you with me so far? Yes. The dollar value of his portfolio is worth $1,100. The company wants to pay a 10% stock dividend for each, uh, to each shareholder. Are you with me so far? Yes. This client's going to get 10% more shares than he had before. How many shares did he have originally? A round lot. 100 shares times 10% means he's going to get an additional 10 shares. So he's going to own 110 shares after the 10% dividend is paid. Am I right? Yes. But he has to own these shares at $1,100 without changing valuation. Therefore, his ownership is going to be diluted and reduced down uh, to $10 per share without changing the valuation on the stock. More shares after the strategy has been implemented? Reducing the price or the ownership of those shares without changing valuation is dilution. If all of those people who own convertible preferred stocks decided to convert those preferred stocks on conversion day into common, then after and through the conversion, won't there be an increase in the number of common stock shares outstanding that will ultimately dilute the stock's price per share? Say yes. yes. The concept of conversion will also cause dilution to the stock's price, the reduction of that stock price going down independent of selling pressure. Uh, and this concept, which I want you to be aware of, is a rights offerings process. The rights offerings process is a process that's only offered by the board of directors of a company to the common stockholder. Are you with me so far? Yes. Now, I'm going to explain to you the rights offerings process before we get into the area of analysis, and I just want to stay with you just a little bit on this process. A rights offerings process allows common stockholders who own stock in a company an opportunity to receive rights for free, for each share of stock that they already own. Those rights then are then broken out and used like money to buy more new shares of stock when the company is issuing more new shares at a cheaper price known as a subscription price if a client subscribes into this process, and you'll see why he might want to, that will be cheaper than the market price of those new shares when they come for sale over the next six months or six weeks. Are you with me so far? Yes. This process is offered to allow existing common stockholders an opportunity to maintain their equity ownership in a company, if not increase their percentage of equity ownership, uh, as a result of participating in the opportunity to buy more new stock so that they can avoid dilution of their ownership of a company. Let me explain to you what I mean. I know that sounds kind of fancy and wild. You got a client who owns 10,000 shares of a stock. Are you with me so far? Yeah. Client says to you, listen, um, I want you to know that every position that we build, every stock that we buy, every company that we own, I have an investment philosophy and mantra in the market. I have to own 1% of every company. It's not necessary for you to really understand my guideline. I just want you to know it's one of my equity investment guidelines to the market. Every stock that we buy in, every company, i got to own at least 1% of that company. Oh, you're in luck, Mr. Johnson, because we just opened up the account and bought 10,000 shares of a company that has a million shares outstanding in the float. You own 1% of this company because 10,000 shares is 1% of a company with a million shares outstanding. And the client's happy. You're tracking the position. You're managing his portfolio. Are you with me so far? Yeah. And you just get, uh, a couple of weeks later, a news announcement from the company company as the financial advisor. And the news announcement says this, two months from today, that company is going to be selling, issuing another 500,000 new shares of stock, are you with me so far, from authorized shares to raise more new capital, for capital expansion. So your first reaction is to contact the client up and say, Mr. Johnson, we have to speak. I just got a news announcement from the company that uh, over the next two months, the company is going to be issuing another new 500,000 shares for sale to raise more new capital. You own 10,000 shares of this company right now. You own 1% of this company. But after those 500,000 shares go for sale two months from today, there's going to be then 1.5 million shares outstanding. The million now? Are you with me so far? And another new 500,000 shares are going to be sold to the open market two months from today for the company to raise more new capital. And you're going to still own 10,000 shares of stock in this company. But 10,000 shares is less than 1% of a company with 1.5 million shares outstanding. So in order to allow you the opportunity to main your, maintain your 1% of equity ownership in this company, uh, the company will allow you to op uh, the opportunity to buy into this new company, buy more new shares today, 
before those 500,000 shares go for sale two months from today, at a cheaper price, you'll be able to buy those new shares today. If you subscribe into this process called the rights offerings process, and that price, a cheaper price, you'll be able to buy the stock at, it's called a subscription price. Subscribing into this process that will be cheaper than the market price of those new shares when they go for sale two months from today, so you'll be allowed to maintain your at least 1% of equity ownership so you can avoid dilution of your percentage of ownership because 10,000 shares that you'll still own will be less than 1% of a company with 1.5 million shares outstanding. Let me show you how the trade goes off. By the way, before I go into this process again of the rights offerings process, there is no one standardized rights offerings processes terms. There are different terms for different rights offerings processes by different companies. Are you with me so far? Yes. I've got a client right here. He owns 10,000 shares in a company. Are you with me so far? Yes. This company has 1 million shares outstanding right now in the float. Your client owns 1% of this company. The company is going to be issuing more new shares for sale two months from today, and your client would like to maintain his 1% of equity ownership. Are you with me so far? Yes. The only way to do that is to buy more new shares in this company today by participating in the rights offerings process and allowing him the opportunity through the process to own those new shares at a cheaper price than the market price that those new shares go for sale two months from today so he can maintain his 1% of equity ownership. Now, let me take a look for you at the terms. What if I told you the client's going to receive... 10 rights, given 10 rights for each share of stock that he owns. Well, if he owns 10,000 shares of stock and he's going to be allocated and given 10 rights for each share of stock that he owns, he's going to then have a total number of accumulated rights to be 100,000 rights. Are you with me so far? Yes. Now the client has a total of 100,000 rights. Now the rights offerings processes term says this. Of your 100,000 rights, these rights are used like money now to buy more new shares. Are you with me so far? Yes. 1,000 rights will be used to buy each new share of stock today that's going to be going for sale two months from today at a cheaper price called a subscription price. If you subscribe into this process today, that will allow you to maintain your equity ownership in this company to be at least 1%. Now, if the client is using rights, 1,000 rights to buy each new share of stock, and he has 100,000 total rights, and he uses up all of his 100,000 rights at a cost of 1,000 rights per share for each new stock, he'll end up buying 100 new shares because 100 new shares at a cost of 1,000 rights per share uses up all the 100,000 rights. Are you with me so far? Yes. By the purchase of this additional 100 new shares, are you with me so far? Yes. In addition to the 10,000 shares that he originally owned, which gives him a total position of 10,100 shares, that might just be enough to maintain his 1% of a company that will have 1.5 million shares outstanding. I can change the terms. What if I told you the rights offerings process says... 5,000 rights are to be used to buy each new share of stock at a cheaper price called a subscription price today. And he has 100,000 total rights. Well, if he uses up all 100,000 rights at a cost of 5,000 rights per share, how many additional shares would he end up owning? 20. Because 20 new shares at a cost of 5,000 rights per share use up the 100,000 rights. So this is an opportunity, this process, to allow common stockholders to use rights to buy more new shares in stock of a company who's selling more new shares so that he can maintain his equity ownership in the company and avoid equity ownership dilution because 10,000 shares will be less than 1% of a company with 1.5 million shares outstanding. And so the process of a rights offerings process, along with conversion and stock dividend distributions and the forward splitting of a stock, all will cause an increase of the number of shares of common outstanding that will ultimately dilute and reduce down the stock's price per share without changing valuation to avoid dilution. I want you to understand the concept of dilution because when we get into strategy week and we start talking about specifically on Friday as a springboard to strategy week, dilution and trading, I want you to be aware of that concept. Are you with me so far? Yes. Now I want to talk to you about the Federal Reserve. How many Federal Reserve banks do we have? Twelve. How many Federal Reserve presidents? Twelve. Who's the chairman? Bernanke, who is coming from the cloth and the philosophy of Greenspan. Are you with me so far? Yes. Most powerful financial figure in the country. There's no question about it. If not, the free world. Now, you want to know how powerful a Fed chairman is? Let me tell you. First of all, when Greenspan was our chairman, and we kept re-electing him because we felt very confident in his economic prowess and his ability to manage the money flow in the economy. Are you with me so far? Yes. He was a country favorite. There's no question about it. But he was of age. 
and it was time for him to move on. And Bernanke, by the way, is probably one of the most brilliant financial minds. If you've ever listened to him talk, he'll stagger you in seconds just on the sophistication of his knowledge of the financial markets. He's overwhelming in power. Are you with me so far? Yeah. The man is so brilliant, it, it's, beyond, it's beyond reproach. i got to tell you something. So is Greenspan. But Greenspan, if you remember him, if you remember him, he was very long-winded, 78-something years old. And, um, you know, when a Federal Reserve chairman... Uh, engages in Federal Reserve monetary policy. Just listen to me for a minute because what I'm about to tell you is staggering. There's this uh, channel on the news called the C-SPAN. I don't know if you've ever seen it. And you might see the Fed chairman sitting at this table with a microphone speaking to the Senate Banking Committee. Are you with me so far? And the um, committee is asking the chairman why the Federal Reserve increased interest rates, what they believe is going to happen to the global markets, and they're interviewing, and those comments go over the airwaves about the Fed chairman and how they feel about monetary policy in the country. It's very powerful. Are you with me so far? Yes. Um, at one point in time in Greenspan's administration, when he was the Fed chairman, and the markets were highly inflated, he said one day, in that Senate Banking Committee hearing, the markets are suffering from irrational exuberance. I mean, he used to talk so long-winded. I used to have palpitations just listening to this guy. Do you remember this guy? He said two words in that statement. Listen to what he said. The markets are suffering from irrational exuberance which means they were irrationally inflated. Stock prices, are you with me so far? Yeah. And on those two words, irrational exuberance, the market went down 390 points on a massive bloodbath and sell-off. I call that power, don't you? Yeah. Jesus Christ. Wow. That's wow. So we have Bernanke now. And um, Federal Reserve Bank in New York is at 33 Maiden Lane. Looks like a prison if you've ever seen it. Are you with me so far? Yeah. And that's... Um, the Federal Reserve in New York, we have 12 Federal Reserve banks. What do the Federal Reserve bank, banking system and banks do? They control M1, M2, M3, and L, which you read about last night. And what the hell is that? And those are the statistical assignments and the measurements that measure the total amount of cash, coin, all of the money in the entire U.S. economy. Just listen. Don't read. Look at me, please. I'm here to help you. Which means that the Fed's primary goal is to do what? Control the amount of money that's put out there into the economy. Are you with me so far? Yes. Maybe they want to put more money into the economy, which would be an expansionary monetary policy. Maybe they would want to contract the amount of money put into the economy. Are you with me so far? Yes. So, as a result, the Fed has only two types of monetary policies, expansionary or contractual. What is monetary policy? The controlled use of the amount of money put out there into the economy. And how do they control how much money is put out there into the economy? Uh, through what are called Federal Reserve tools. Are you with me so far? Yes. I'm about to give you these bullet points now in a moment before we get involved into this area. We'll take a five-minute break just to take those notes. Are you with me so far? Yes. I just want to set you up for the area that we're about to go into. And that is that these monetary policy tools are on the Series 7 examination. Now, these are Fed tools. Are you with me so far? Yes. One of those tools you know about is the movement of interest rates, short-term cost of borrowing money. Now, when I use the words interest rates in this segment right now, in the language of the Federal Reserve, we refer to the interest rate as the cost of borrowing money. Whether it's the prime rate, the discount rate, the Fed funds rate, any rate that I qualify right now in the language of the Federal Reserve is to be viewed at, interpreted at for the seven, the cost of borrowing money. When I talk about interest rates in week three, in the bond weeks, are you with me so far? We're going to look at interest rates as the interest income on our money because we know something about interest rates now. Definitionally, they are a double-edged sword. They are not only the cost of borrowing money interest rates in the Fed markets right now, but they also represent that same interest rate movement, interest income on new bonds. Are you with me so far? Yes. So we're all going to take a little bit of a time out right now, and I'm going to give you some new bullet notes as we start moving into the Federal Reserve. And, of course, we're on our boxing on our chart, uh, and then we'll get into monetary policy. So let's take a five-minute uh, timeout on those notes right now, Brian. Thank you very much. Brian, I wanted to do that for you so you can hit this board. So we covered what I wanted to cover associated with dilution. Now we're going to monetary policy. Let's take these notes down for the second segment, okay?
represented by the index called the Consumer Price Index, which is the price of goods and services that we pay for uh, that reflect the cost of inflation. Has anybody in this room driven into the city today? Parked down here? Yes. Okay. First name? What? What's your first name? Doug. Doug. I'm going to get it right. Uh, Doug, did you park down here? Uh, park and Ranch. Okay. How much did it cost to park today, would you say? Okay, I don't know how you did that, but let's assume, let's assume, let's make an assumption that's a fair assumption. You want to say 40? 40 is the right number. It costs $40 to park today, or any day down here uh, in the city. Now, uh, did you have to pay any tolls to come over into the city today? $3 was that round trip or one way? So it would be $6 in tolls, right? So tolls are $6. You um, had to pay for gas. We really have to include that in that. Let's, let's be safe. Let's just put $10 for gas just for today because that's not going to go too far, but maybe enough. This is one day. Look at this carefully. Now, we're going to have lunch. And let's assume you didn't brown bag it and you go buy a regular sandwich and you get a special and you have a soda. Well, yeah. Well, let's, 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 let's put lunch in. I'm going to be safe on this one. I'm going to say lunch is $8. I'm just going to be nice about this one. Are you with me so far? And I want to make an assumption um, that I think is a relatively safe assumption with respect to the parking costs and the toll and, of course, gas and lunch, that this was your cost just to get in and get your education today. And how much does this add up? $62. $62. It's a $62 day. Now, when are we meeting next? Right. Of course, um, Friday you're going to come to work, and I want you to make an assumption further that you're going to go to the same garage. Uh, but when you get to that garage on Friday, I want to tell you what he's going to tell you. Uh, you know, costs went up. It's no longer 40, it's 42. And prices went up over the last couple of days. Okay. Uh, we'll keep the tolls at 6, but gas went up, now it's 12, and the sandwich costs 10. Are you with me so far? So how much is Friday now? I'm sorry? This is not tough. This can't be tough. Don't do this to me today. How much is this? 42 and 6 and 12 and 10. First row 64. All right, first is 64. I trusted you. You see that? I shouldn't have trusted you. How much is this day today on Friday? Yeah, 70. I'm sorry? $70. Can I trust you on that one too? Okay. Now, on Friday, when you go, um, you're going to give them the same amount of money that you had on Wednesday today. I mean, you're not making any more new money between Wednesday and Friday, am I right? Yet this same dollar, I told you I'd give this back to you, I just didn't tell you how. This same dollar is losing its purchasing power, am I right? I mean, it's chasing these rising prices. Your dollar, index for inflation, can only buy 18 cents worth of goods and services. Your dollar's not getting a full bang for its buck, am I right? You're looking at inflation. What is inflation? The loss of the purchasing power of that dollar. That's pure inflation. Rising prices are eroding the purchasing power of that dollar. The dollar could no longer purchase the dollar's worth of goods and cents. Am I right? Yes. When the Fed sees this occur, the rising prices that we're talking about is not just the cost of energy, gas, tolls, milk, tuition. The costs of goods and services that we need to continue to pay for in order to survive. But also, they're looking at the stock market and they're seeing rising stock prices as well. Are you with me so far? Yes. They're worried that the economy is suffering from inflation. Are you with, what is inflation? Seven rising prices. When you see the language anywhere of rising prices, you're dealing with an inflated economy. You are the Federal Reserve. And what your main concern is... Curve inflation, cool down inflation, cool down those prices across the board. Are you with me so far? Yes. And so now the Fed understands that during this inflation uh, and inflationary periods of time, there's a lot of liquidity out there. As a matter of fact, there's too much money out there overheating the economy. Look at me. So what the Fed wants to do is they kind of want to throw antifreeze on the economy and cool it down. Are you with me so far? Yes. They want to cool down those stock prices and cool down prices in every sector. The last thing the Fed wants people to do, institutions, businesses, individual people, is to borrow as much as they deem necessary and put that money out there that's already in abundance and overheated. Are you with me so far? Yes. They want to deter the amount of money that's being borrowed. They know 
that it's not feasible to assume that they can eliminate borrowing entirely in the economy. They'll always be borrowing no matter what the cost. Are you with me so far? Yeah. But they can induce a reduction of the amount of money being borrowed if they make the cost of borrowing money